Hey, I never wanted to be a writer, ever. Like, ever. I've never sat down and thought to myself, oh boy, I would love to become an author at some point in my life. That's never, never been an idea for me. However, through my life, I've always ended up writing things. And I, I know that sounds really strange, but it's it writing is a brilliant way of facilitating other creative things that I was really interested in. Uh, so I've always been interested in film. I've always been interested in creativity. Creativity? That's the wrong word. I've always been interested in like creative writing from a fiction sense, as long as it leads to like a song or a machinima, <laughs> you know, as long as it wasn't just going to stay on the page because I suck at reading. I hate reading, man. When I think about when I think about things that I uh, that I am like the worst at, reading is easily number one. I, as a kid, I used to pretend I enjoyed it. I used to pretend I used to go around and and constantly read books all the time, and mainly because my mum would be proud of me when I read books because she loves books. My mum, she's an author, so she she loves that kind of stuff, and um, <laughs> I always used to read because I used to think that was what normal kids did. But it didn't, it, took, it didn't take me very long to realize that actually I can't see images in my head. I, I can't see stuff in my head like most people can. And uh, I've got it very badly. I, genu I can't make out anything, which weirdly gives me a very good sense of direction. But it means that I can't... It's, you know, there's that joke where it's like, don't imagine a penguin. And then, oh, you're imagining a penguin. Ha ha. I, I never got that. Do you guys, do you fuckers actually imagine penguins? <laughs> like, I, it just doesn't, it just doesn't make sense to me. You know, like, like... The idea of just, don't imagine a penguin. Okay. I never have, you know. The best way I can describe uh, this condition, it's not really a condition, it doesn't really affect me too much, but the best way I can describe this, this experience of life is I can understand concepts in my head. So I always tell myself little stories in my head before I go to bed. Uh, the current one I'm on right now, I'm, I'm, I'm a, <laughs> it's so lame. Try and, try and explain the little stories you make up in your head before sleep. They are so lame when you say them out loud. But I am a member of the secret service for a president, right? In like this fake town I've invented. And I'm like the secret service. And I was so good at being secret service that I've been promoted to vice president. <laughs> it's, it's so lame. They're always so lame when you read them out. But, where was I going with this? Yeah, so, but I can still imagine those places in my head. I can still picture them, but I can't see them. I just understand concepts. Almost like a blind man can understand what a room looks like by touching the walls. I can imagine, you know, walking down a street in this area, but I just can't see it, you know? I can just get the idea for it. I can feel the wind. I can, like, you know, I can picture the direction I'm going in. This gives me a really good sense of direction, just around about. Like, I've always been told this by people that I'm, I'm very good at figuring out where I am in the world. But anyway, I never wanted to be a writer, despite writing a lot. Mainly because I found books boring. But nevertheless, I decided, you know, I wanted to try writing books because I thought my mum would think it was cool. So I started writing a book called The Picture Book. Right? <laughs> to avoid as much text as possible. I made a book that was entirely pictures and my whole ethos for it was that I wasn't going to use any text. It was just going to be images. Problem is though, I can't draw either. <laughs> and I also <laughs> and I also didn't stick to my ethos for very long because eventually I started using long drawn out text to explain what was happening in each frame. Which really defeats the point of how interesting the idea of, of a of a seven-year-old making a book entirely done through pictures with no text. But anyway, th there were two people in the picture book at the beginning, which grew to an extensive cast of over 20 that I started even forgetting after a while. I'll try to remember some of you now, but the main two were Indy and Larry. Indy being a gentleman wearing a white shirt with a red circle on it. Which sounds very Fairly Odd Parents when I think back on it now. And I probably did rip it from Fairly Odd Parents. But it was a white shirt with a red circle on it. I never coloured these in. I just remember what the colours were supposed to be. He also had blue jeans. Because I thought that was all everyone wore. Literally up until about age 18. I didn't know people wore things other than blue jeans. I knew people wore skinny black jeans. But I thought oh yeah they're just hipsters. You know I didn't understand. I just... <laughs> I, I tell you, I was a very different person up until about age 21. I was a really weird, like, different person. It's crazy. Anyway, so in this picture, but there was Indy, who was a man with a white shirt and a red circle on the shirt and blue jeans. And he had a very neat combed haircut, very prim, and a very round head. And Larry. Larry was a horse. 
And I'm, I, I've made it my thing that in this podcast, I'm not going to show any imagery, but I'll try and explain this horse to you because it was not a horse. When you imagine a horse, just to throw that out the window, Larry had essentially bosoms for a face. He had these two round lips, I guess, as a head, like these two bulges coming out of his face, right? And his eye was on one. The crack between the two, two uh, semicircles was his mouth. On top of this, he had ears and a very straight flat top haircut. Think like um, think like that guy off of Hey Arnold, you know Arnold's friend. <laughs> in, in it. It's just a very flat haircut, like a very like square, like a tower coming out the top of his head. And round the back, he had a very badly drawn tail and four legs that were all visible at the same time on one side of his body. That was it. That was that was Larry the horse. Now Larry the horse was. I, I I don't think I actually gave either of these people personalities. Basically, they just ended up getting hurt over and over again. Larry would fall off cliffs. Indy would shoot Larry with a rifle sometimes for some reason, which um, I had to stop doing after my mum told me I, I can't make them using guns because my mum doesn't like me using stuff with guns in my things. Do you know, my mum used to tell me that if I wanted to join the army, she'd lock me in the cupboard because she didn't want me to join the army. Fair enough, mum. Good on you, mum. Uh, but, um, yeah, she didn't like me drawing guns, so I had to quickly stop them being mean to each other. But I started to get creative and started to add new creatures. I don't remember who the third one, but I remember very clearly, um, Z-Prof, who was a, who was a constant silhouette of a Jacques Cousteau style... Is it Jacques Cousteau style? Uh, I don't remember. Like, the, the guy who, the guy who's like, uh... Now we will venture into the wonder underwater world. That, 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 the French guy. <laughs> it was basically that was the character, but he was constantly a silhouette. He was a permanent silhouette in the ocean, which I'm pretty sure I took from an old albino black sheep, like, flash movie called the Crazy Cartoon Movie, which I'm really tempted to watch, like, with you guys, like, on my live stream or something soon. That would be very funny. We just sit down and watch the crazy cartoon movie from, like, 2004. But, yeah, I'm pretty sure I stole it from that. And Z-Prof used to go around with his flashlight and shine it on things and go, Ah, it is a beautiful puffer fish. And then the puffer fish would kill him or something. You know, that was, that was, the, that was the extent of the comedy, constantly. And then there was um, Benji Bub. I remember Benji Bub was a puffer fish, funnily enough, uh, with very, very pursed lips. Uh, there was Benji Bub, was was a puffer fish. We had uh, we I had a group of hedgehogs as well. Oh, I actually made an entire comic about these hedgehogs that were all basically just rip off of peanuts. You know, Charlie Brown and Snoopy. I basically just ripped off peanuts and made an entire hedgehog comic series. Uh, before we go on to that though, I will say that picture book with Indian Larry. I made five editions. I filled out five full books, like thick books, like blank books with this. And they're all gone. I've asked, I've asked my mum where they've gone. I don't know. They've just been lost to the years and I will probably never see them again. I know that if I do see them again, though, I will probably cry. So it's probably good that I don't see them again because those are old. And I spent so much time. I used to sit down in the shops while my mum was shopping and just do these books on like, in like the doorway. And like people used to step around me. <laughs> so yeah. I, I think I will, those are very attached to me and it's kind of good that they've disappeared without upsetting me. You know, they're just kind of gone and I'm not too fussed. Anyway, the hedgehogs. I started a series of comic books, not quite as long, about hedgehogs. And the hedgehogs were all drawn the exact same way. They had a, they had a very round underbelly, few spikes and a little sort of nibbly nose. And that was it. That was their face. And they all had different personalities. Some of them were sharper than others. And they all had, they, these guys all had different personalities. Unlike Indian Larry, who were just who were just basically punching bags. These guys had different personalities. And the hedgehogs had little stories, little adventures. They were very vapid adventures. And they were stolen immediately from Peanuts. One of them was really into the guitar and had a bust of Brian May that he carried around with him. Brian May from Queen. And he would carry around Brian May, similar to Beethoven being carried around by, is it Linus from Peanuts? I don't know, the piano guy. <laughs> it was like an identical like bust. And that was that was my hedgehogs. And then there was Carly, who had, like, winged eyeliner. And I remember I didn't understand, but I remember I was experimenting with faces, and I realized that drawing winged eyeliner on something made it look more feminine in my eyes. So I was like, that's Carly. Also, I thought Carly was, like, the most attractive name when I was, like, nine years old. So there we go. Nine-year-old me really liked 
the name Carly. It's probably it probably comes from some porno I accidentally watched when I was too young. That's the thing with in internet access. Like I'm so glad that kids that people understand the internet more because my parents didn't understand the internet and neither did I. And I stumbled across. You know, it was like the internet was great growing up. I got to have Neopets, got to have Club Penguin, and I got to watch hardcore gore videos. Like I've just I've I've seen worse stuff when I was nine years old than I would happily watch now. <laughs> you know, like it's mental. It's crazy. But yeah, so Carly was the most attractive name to me because I'm pretty sure I probably watched some American porno by accident that didn't understand what was going on, but was like, oh, pretty girl. Yes, Carly. That's Carly. Pretty name. <laughs> but yeah, my grandpa was a really brilliant artist. He was amazing at it. Uh, he used to have a shed in his back garden where he would make things. And he used to make these absolutely brilliant, like, like sculpted stuff. And he used to paint these brilliant pictures. He was really into, like, Chinese... Uh, um, what's the word? It's like di dynasty style uh, artwork. You know, what's the, I don't understand. I don't know the words. Like traditional Chinese, like stencil drawings. Uh, he was really into. He liked his like dragons and stuff. And my grandma, who's still alive today, bless her. I love my grandma. She's still she's still hopping about. She still has all of my grandpa's old artwork and stuff. And I love visiting her to see it. It's really nice to have. <clears throat> <coughs> Sorry, I don't have any water. Um, it's really interesting to go and visit and see, like, you know, that's my, that's my grandfather, that's my, that's my flesh and blood, you know? He, he's, and seeing all this cool stuff that he made, it's like, I'm not crying, I just really need some water, hold on. I'll see if I have any. <coughs> I understand, it sounds like I'm crying, I've just eaten a peanut, I was eating peanuts earlier, and they caught in my throat. Uh, I might go and get a drink in a minute. I actually don't have any editing software, so I might have to just run really quickly and leave you with dead air. God, how weird will that be? This is a really slapdash podcast, isn't it? Do you know I don't edit this podcast? I just hit record and talk and then upload. I think you guys would prefer it like that. Let me know if you'd prefer if I could, like, actually edit this podcast. Because I can. But, I, I, you know, and I have the time. I just thought you'd be interested in hearing a very brain-to-mouth funnel, you know? Anyway, that's not what this is about. I don't like to talk about the podcast on the podcast. Hence why I just say hey and get straight into it. <laughs> um, yeah, but it's really nice seeing my grandpa's work. And it's really it's really inspiring for me as a creative to know that, you know, I hope he'd be proud. I hope he'd be proud of what I'm getting up to now. And he'd be very impressed with some of the things I can do. Because I didn't know how to play any musical instruments when he, when he knew me. I didn't know how to, you know, I wasn't making anything. I wasn't, you know, I didn't really have a career in mind. I was very young when he died. So I think he'd be proud. Anyway, I really hated reading, but there was one thing I really did like, and that was choose your own adventure books, <laughs> which, which I loved. I used to have this fantasy medieval one, which was essentially like, it was basically about taking down an evil warlock. And I used to read it and I used to cheat incessantly. I wonder if any of you used to do this too. It used to be like, turn to page three if you want to try and cross the river. I'd turn to page three and look and it would say like, you die. And I was, I was like, okay. So I'd flip back. <laughs> like I like reloaded a save. What's that called? Save scumming. I would like save scum to get back to where I was. So I would then go, okay, I'll do the other option then. But this book I read about the warlock knew that people would do that. So it like made it like a winding path so that sometimes a decision you made about five decisions back would be the thing that kills you. So, so you couldn't just go back to your previous point because then you just end up dying on that route anyway. So every decision, unless you remembered the path perfectly that you took, every decision was really, really incremental and had a huge, like, could have massive overreaching consequences down the line. And that was so inspiring to me. I loved it. It also had an inventory system. You had to have a piece of paper on hand to write down how much money you had. Oh, genius. It was genius. So clever. So inspiring. So ahead of its time, I'd say. It's like a massive thing that's really helped me understand permanence in fiction. I think permanence in fiction is so important. Coming from the man who wants to be revived on a... <laughs> on a server. But I love permanence, man. I think permanence is so important. If a character dies in a story, they need to be fucking dead. They are gone. They don't come back. You know, it's that's it forever. What's the point? You know, can you imagine if David Tennant in Doctor Who said, I don't want to go. And then they went, oh, okay, he's back. <laughs> you know, permanence is so important. But anyway, I think those choose your own adventure books were the last books I ever properly got into. I, my favorite book of all time is a Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, but it's just not as 
man it's just not as no, it's just that it's the only one I can get into. It's like, it's just nothing compared to like a film. Like, even though the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy film isn't that great, it's got Martin Freeman in, he's a brilliant actor, but I don't think the film's that good. I still prefer it to reading, you know? Although I have so I, I do love some great quotes from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy that really stuck with me from being a kid. There's um the one about uh, dolphins thinking they're smarter than people and people thinking they're smarter than dolphins. So it's a uh, uh, the the smartest animal on earth is the mouse. Spoiler alert in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. The second smartest is the dolphin, and the third smartest is humans, right? And the reasoning that Douglas Adams, the writer of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the reason he gives that dolphins are the second smartest is humans think they are the smartest because they create cities and, and build bombs and shoot each other and they have digital watches. Dolphins think they're the smartest. No, I've ruined it. I've ruined the quote. Humans think they're the smartest because they build cities and have wars and shoot each other and bomb each other and have digital watches and they think dolphins are the stupidest because all they do is flop around in water and eat fish and, and, and you know, and hit a ball and go, eh, you know. Dolphins think they're the smartest for the exact reasons that humans think they're the dumbest. <laughs> Which I love, that's such a good quote. It, there's so many good quotes. <laughs> it was it. Um, in the beginning, the universe was created, which many consider to be a bad idea. Uh, yeah. So that was the last sort of book I probably got into. But the adventure books were sort of the last ones I can remember sinking my teeth into and reading properly. Uh, so my next bout of writing actually came in the form of a Tamagotchi fiction that I, I posted on the forum Tamatalk. It was called Shell Life. And uh, a play on the phrase shelf life, which was actually quite a smart play on words when you know the plot. I don't think I could come up with something that <laughs> smart nowadays, but it was called shell life. And it was about someone who's basically transported into their Tamagotchi and they become a Tamagotchi and are put up on a shelf in a shop. And it was about the, and it was about the adventures of this person who's now become a Tamagotchi living on the shelf of, of a Toys R Us or whatever. I thought I was a genius. Uh, until I very quickly realized that it, there's not much scope for progression in my story, you know? Oh no, I'm a Tamagotchi on a shelf. I hope someone turns me, turns, turns it on. I hope someone turns the Tamagotchi on. That was it. That was the story, you know? It was, it was, it was bad. It was bad. But I know, I know a lot of you listening have probably written fiction on forums. I know Technoblade used to, and I've read it, and I really like it. I'm a big fan of it. I love I if you if you write if you're interested in writing and you want them you would like to be an author man that's where to start just write you know that what are you waiting for I didn't even want to be a writer I just wanted to I just wanted people to praise me I guess and I wanted people on the Tamagotchi forum to be like wow that's really cool good job will and so that's why and good job settings so that's why I wrote on it I guess my next foray was into World of Warcraft. I was so taken by World of Warcraft at the time. World of Warcraft was, to me, the most inspiring thing in the world. As someone who'd never read Lord of the Rings, as someone who'd never, you know, been interested in fantasy, World of Warcraft was my look into Tolkien-esque fantasy. And I was blown away. I was just enthralled by it as a teenager. It must have been about 12, 13, 14. Uh, I decided I wanted to make parody songs and machinimas around World of Warcraft. I made them over copyright licensing free, uh, <laughs> license free um, sounds uh, that I didn't really know were license free. So I did it on um, the Nutcracker Suite. I wrote a song about Christmas. And I also made a machinima called Wolfie Yan, the World of Warcraft story, which was an extensive story about my character on, on World of Warcraft called Wolfie Yan. Who had a raptor called Carlos, who used to say, "My name is Carlos. You have killed my family." Which, looking back on it, that's from something. That's it. He goes, "You have killed my family. Prepare to die." It's from something. Is it from "Dude, Where's My Car"? It's from something like '90s, 2000s comedy. I just don't remember where it's from, but I got it from that. I basically just ripped all of it off, and it was all about my um. It was all just about adventures of this of this World of Warcraft troll, and I've completely lost it all. I don't know where it's gone. I, I deleted it all at one point because I was scared of my friends at school finding it and making fun of me. But I didn't private it. I just straight up deleted it. And now it's gone. And I have no idea where it's gone anymore. And I, I wish I had it back. 
I really wish I could watch it again because I have no idea how shit it was or how good it was. But it, I spent a lot of time on these machinimas. I used to pump out episodes. I had like 20 episodes of the shit. Yeah. So if anyone knows how I can recover Wolfie Gan, the World of Warcraft story, if any YouTube employees are here who have access to the, to the files, please give them to me. I did, I must, I can't talk about machinima without going into the Minecraft machinima I made as a teenager too. About age 15, 16, I started making Minecraft machinima. I made one called Lost at Sea. Featuring my friends, one from New Zealand, one from two doors down. <laughs> and it was, it was very, it was really fun making this sort of machinima about being lost at sea uh, on a boat. It didn't really go very far. It didn't have too much to it. But I remember pissing people off because I remember I like had another rival YouTuber who also had the intention, <laughs> also had the intention of making a machinima about being lost at sea. And they got very annoyed at me when I allegedly copied them. My machinimas, I still look back on as quite boring. I made RuneScape machinimas too. You can watch them on my first channel. I made little RuneScape videos. Uh, yeah. But those weren't too much about writing. When we go back into proper creative writing, we have to talk about drama. I took drama in secondary school. In year 10 was when I took it. Year 9, I think, year 10. And that was probably the best decision I made <laughs> at that age, at about the age of 14, 15. Joining drama was the best decision I could have made. I didn't want to do it. I was very considering doing citizenship, which is um, uh, PSHE for you older people in the in the podcast <laughs> in the chat i i want to do citizenship uh but then I, I decided to do drama and my god was it a good decision i discovered this joy for acting and performance that i didn't know i had i i i basically like not to blow my own trumpet but i found out i'm quite good at it <laughs> i found out i'm pretty good and i think it was because i spent so much time playing in my own imagination as a kid because I was an only child. I spent so much time playing in my own, own imagination. I didn't really have brothers and sisters to play with. And I, I used to I used to love video games. But my mum and dad used to take me outside so much. That I'd just be sort of left to my own devices a lot of the time. Which gave me quite a good sort of acting ability. Uh, at that age at least. I don't know if it's probably deteriorated since then. I'm not as good as I probably was for my age back then. But joining drama was really good for me. And for a final drama piece. We had to write our own play or at least one person in our group did and I decided to spearhead that choice uh so I decided to do a little test run before we did the final piece so I had to I, I improvised a piece uh which which in in our school meant to write improvise it wasn't improvised like like improv off the cuff it was written as a script I wrote a script about a man on a train who has his bag next to him on the seat next to him taking up two seats uh, and basically it was a series of monologues of characters who would come onto the stage and complain at this man who's left his bag on the chair. And they'd get more and more vitriolic at each other and more and more angry until finally it's revealed at the end that the guy was an angel. <laughs> and he was on his way to bring these people together so that they could meet each other and learn to be humble. That was it. That was the story. It was basically I decided... I was on the train one day and decided I was really pissed off at an old woman who put a bag on the chair next to her so I couldn't sit down. I decided I was annoyed. So I was like, nah, let's turn it on its head. Let's make this person a lovely person. Let's make this person nice. And I made this and I remember I played a part in it. I wasn't the angel. I was one of the angry people on the train. The part I played in it was I came on with some flowers and I, I, I came on and, and my part was to go up to the front of the stage. By the way, this is one of the most like upsetting things that happened to me in my childhood. I, this is like one of the most socially like anxiety inducing moments for me. So I hope you will, you will understand and someone will relate to this. But I came on the stage and I wasn't a good looking kid. I wasn't. I had bad braces. I had an awful Suffolk accent. Not that the Suffolk accent is awful, but I had it bad. And I had like scruffy hair and I smelled a bit. I didn't wash very much. So I come on the stage with these flowers, with these like prop flowers, and the girl in my group goes, goes, ah, oh, well, who are the flowers for? And I go, ah, oh, it's for my girl. And everyone in the crowd laughed. So everyone in the crowd laughed so hard that the teacher had to get everyone to settle down because just the idea of me having a girlfriend was hilarious to them. <laughs> they, thought, they thought the idea of, of old Wilbur up there having a girlfriend was, was ridiculous. Yeah, that hurt. That hurt. But I showed them. I showed them. 
Because I was then chosen because of how well I wrote the last thing. I was chosen to go and write the next piece, which I titled Inventing the Telephone. Now, Inventing the Telephone was a piece that I look back on today and I'm so proud of it. Even as me as a 24 year old man, I look back on this thing I wrote when I was 16 and I am just so proud. It was such a good idea. Essentially, it's very, it's very cliche in its premise, but the way it was executed was quite interesting. The premise is a man who is prince of a kingdom. He's quite weak. He's quite gentle. He's passive. He doesn't like to hurt anyone. He's a bit of a romantic, you know, he's, he, he's very Shakespearean-esque. He likes to talk and be very like monologue and, and he's, he's very like, like, like thespian. He, he is banished from his kingdom by his father, who's a militaristic like warlord. And he's banished because his father beats him in a fight and blinds him in one eye. This is very Avatar. I know you're thinking it is pretty Avatar. I didn't. I don't think I'd actually seen the Last Airbender at that point. But you see how cliche the premise is. Uh, he was basically banished from his kingdom. Uh, him and his uh, servant Chives were banished from the kingdom. The prince name is just Prince, by the way. Uh, they were banished from the kingdom, and that he wants to get back in. He wants to assert his place as a prince and get back into the kingdom. You know, get in like insert himself back into the running of the people. So him and his and his manservant uh, come up with a plan to uh, to to basically create something so magnificent that the king has to let him back in. And as they're talking, a blueprint slaps uh, the prince in the face. And upon opening it and reading it, they can see it's actually a blueprint for a telephone. Now, very much in this universe, the telephone doesn't exist. So they find the blueprint for the telephone, full with copper wire and and like and and dialing tones and and all these speaker systems and and transistors and stuff. And he looks at it and they think, hmm, I don't know what any of this means, but they like the idea. So they find an engineer and they say to the engineer, hey, how can we make this without using any of the materials? And the engineer describes how you know we can do it using a series of parrots, where we get a long tube and we put a parrot at one end who set, who listens, flies to the other end of the tube for a cracker, takes the cracker and then speaks what was said at the other end of the tube, right? So you can already see the humor there. It's ridiculous. You could just not have a tube. But um, yeah, they, they come up with this tube with parrots and parrots that, that fly along and eat the crackers, right? So then they decide they need to go and find someone to get crackers. So they meet a um, they meet a con artist, a shady con artist, who basically says that she can scam out some of the materials that they need because they need a... Um, a side. They need something, a, a really important material that's really expensive. Uh, so he's, so she says she can do it, but they're going to need a salesman in order to then sell the telephone when they made it. So they find a salesman. And now there's these five unlikely characters. This, this prince who wants to get back into his kingdom. This servant who's just doing as the prince says. That was played by me. Uh, the uh, engineer who just wants to make this incredible device, the con artist who wants to make a quick buck, and the salesman who wants to attest himself as one of the as one of the like most shrewd businessmen on the planet. All five of them with these different motives are trying to create this telephone and it was a comedy. And it ends with the con they build the telephone and then the con artist steals it for herself and goes and sells it. So they all walk off stage and they're all miserable. The end. <laughs> that was my play. And I wrote this and my teacher loved it so much that she kept checking up on us and kept like seeing how the progress was going. We created these props. We created the stage set and stuff. And eventually came the day of performance and it went amazingly. All of us nailed it. I was Chives, the servant. And uh, my, uh, David from Soot House was the, uh, was the prince. And Rihanna from Soot House was the con artist lady. And we all, we, we did this, we nailed this performance. And we got a big round of applause and we were we were picked as like the best best play on the evening which was really really cool that was like a huge confidence boost for me and I, let me tell you this now if, you, if you're listening to this and you're a young man or woman or or anything in between and you're you're 15 16 years old let me tell you do stuff do stuff that can improve your confidence more than anything do stuff that will make people go wow you know, make stuff for yourself by all means, but also seek out that approval, seek out that praise. And it may take you years, but it will come. And when it comes, that confidence boost is what you need to launch you, I think, into the next step of your learning. I, I, that's genuinely what I believe. It doesn't matter if you haven't had this 
um, this input ever. It doesn't matter if you haven't had this this confidence boost yet. It happens eventually, and that and I genuinely think the praise I got for my play was the big confidence boost that really told me, you know, as a human being, yeah, you can do what you want to do, you know. And I feel like that's so important, and I'm so glad that opportunity was given to me, and I'm, I'm very privileged and humbled by it. And if you have the opportunity to go for it, I understand not everyone is as privileged as I was to have that opportunity to perform a play in front of a school. But if you can, and if you have that opportunity, take it, man. Take it. After I did that, I decided I wanted to write lots of stuff. My writing turned from books to very quickly film. I decided I wanted to be a film director. That was the spark in me that made me want to be a film director. I wrote several films. I wrote one called The Egg which was based around the short story, which has now become very famous nowadays, I believe, but at the time was quite underground, of a um, of when you die, you actually go and visit God, and God gets you ready to go into the next body of the next person. It turns out you live the life of every single person on Earth. It's a really cool idea I saw. I think I saw it on Tumblr in like 2015, and I was like, that's really cool. So I decided to make it. There was Shadow Play, which was a horror film I made, based around a... Um, a, a, a wildlife photographer who sets up some tripwires and the tripwires trigger and photograph like what is apparently nothing but the longer you look at the photograph you start to see there's little things wrong there's nothing intensely scary in any of the images that are taken by the tripwire photography but like you start to notice that like the candles are facing different directions, you know, and the trees are lit up in a strange way and things. You start to notice little things are wrong and it's all very badly photo photographed. And slowly as it as it goes on and on, you start to see it's starting to get weirder and weirder. The rope, the tripwire is a different colour in one of the photographs. And like in one of the photographs, you can very clearly see the man, even though he wasn't in front of the camera and things, you know, and, it's, and it goes more and more and more until eventually I got this big commissioned monster outfit and it like comes out of the bushes and then cuts to black very quickly. It was it was really fun. It was a it was scary. It scared. It's I think it scared my girlfriend at the time. So that was my that was my thumbs up of approval that I did a good job. It was only like three minutes long. I made a lot of these mainly for college. Uh, these little films. Uh, eventually, I moved on to music videos though, which don't require as much writing. But I'll tell you what does require writing: music. <laughs> it was around age twenty. I picked up a guitar for the first time. Uh, I decided I wanted to play the guitar. So I locked myself in my bedroom for 10 hours a day uh, while I was I was in a pretty bad place in the ages 19, 20, 21. That's a very broad, that's a very broad three year span. I wasn't in an awful place, but it was, it was a lot of the time I was miserable, you know, in that area, especially in, at age 20. Uh, I'd just been declined from a lot of my universities of choice and I, um, I was working the night shift at a convenience store. I wasn't very happy. Uh, so I decided I wanted to learn music. Uh, so I picked up a guitar for the first time and I wrote my first song, which I still have. And I'm going to play for you right now, uh, on the podcast. This is a song I wrote in what year? In 2016. It is called Vitriol. And, uh, it's a song, I'm not entirely sure what it's about. Uh, but I remember this is the first ever song I wrote first ever i've written some bad songs and this one isn't too bad but it's it's you can see how far i've come from here this was the first song I, obviously i've been playing guitar for a little bit at this point i am um, uh, i've been playing covers though entirely and this was the this was the first original piece i'd written that i still have saved <laughs> you've been talking about me heard you've been taking remedies I'm a fire I'm your grace I'm what you've been meddling in so take a stand kill me if you must but leave my past on out of it I don't know if I'm gonna break I don't know if I'm gonna take one more I don't know if I'm gonna break I don't know if I'm gonna take one more your vitriol
Take another if you must Take a second key If it helps to kill the pain If it blocks my memory Losing face. Losing face, right? You're the only one who's free. Sorry about You can't go round. You can't go under. So the only thing's to go straight through it all. I don't know if I'm gonna break. I don't know if I'm gonna take one more. I don't know if I'm gonna break. I don't know if I'm gonna take one more. So you can hear how that was recorded on my <laughs> on my headset microphone uh, that I was using while playing League of Legends. You can hear some references to Losing Face in that, which is one of my one of my released songs. Uh, yeah, you can hear a lot of a lot of elements of my music that I've kept, especially that little glockish build. Ding, 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 ding. That's something I I would do nowadays. Yeah, it's a bit of a crap song though. It's it doesn't really go anywhere, and it's it's just about drugs. It's about I think I was I think I've been I think I've been dumped, <laughs> and I, I think that was about drug use from a from an ex. So yeah, that was that that was my that was my song Vitriol, and uh, I wrote a lot of songs that were like very serious, very, especially folky. I went through a very folky phase, very into Pat the Bunny, uh, Andrew Jackson, Jihad, things like that. Very into that sort of vibe. Uh and uh, the front bottoms obviously <laughs> so that, that i think that song is very front bottoms personally so after after i gave that a go i decided i wanted to move on to comedy because comedy i felt really pushed out my my feelings a lot better in a weird way nowadays i'd say music about emotions pushes out my feelings but back then 100 percent my my emotions were pushed out through comedy so i started writing songs i think the first comedy song i ever wrote uh, was the porn title song, which was a song I wrote entirely through titles of pornography uh, that I'd that I'd found online, real pornography titles that I'd found online. Uh, this this song is awful. It's just not very good. Uh, I played it live a few times, which makes me cringe. Uh, and it's just yeah, no one really laughed. It it wasn't funny. I I look back on it and I'm like, this just wasn't funny. Will, why did you make this? <laughs> But um, yeah, I was just I just wanted to sound like Filthy Frank, I guess. So I wrote that. And then I wrote the Nice Guy Ballad. Uh, the Nice Guy Ballad being sort of the, my first foray into looking at toxic masculine ideals. Then I went into um, I Am Very Smart, which was one of my worst songs again. And then Karen, Please Come Back, I Miss the Kids, which is good if it didn't sound identical to Toothpaste Kisses by the Maccabees. Uh, yeah, and then finally, uh, I wrote I'm In Love With An E-Girl. Uh, which, if you know anything about me, is a song I've written uh, last year, January last year, I released it. But I wrote it in 2019, early 2019, like February. And I hated it. I wrote it and I was like, this is crap. This is, this is just dreadful. I thought it was awful. So I just never went anywhere with it. I just, I, I stopped. I, I just went, yep, can that. We'll move on. We'll, we'll write something better. And um, I didn't. I didn't bother writing anything better. I then went through my sad period, which I'll go on to in a minute. But afterwards, I was on a plane. I was on a plane coming back from Barcelona. And um, after a very nice holiday in Barcelona, uh, probably one of my favorite holidays I've had recently. And um, I, uh, on the train, on the plane back, uh, I don't know what it is about planes, but the I don't know if it's the air pressure or just the air inside makes me really like feel music more. But I listened to it and I listened to my writing and the song and I was like, this isn't that bad. And by the way, the version I listened to is the version you know. It's not even like a draft. I was listening to the version that was released. And I went, fuck it. I'll just make a music video for this. So I finished the music video that I'd started in 2019. I finished it off and I was like, okay, I'll upload it to my music channel. And at this point, Elodie said to me, why don't you upload it to your main channel? Like 2019 Guy, uh, cr uh, Critical. You may know uh, Charlie with his band, The Gentlemen. Uh, they have a song called 2019 Guy, which is very similar actually to my Nice Guy ballad. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, I said, okay, I'll upload to my main channel. 
I uploaded it to my main channel and it was my worst, it was like my 10 of 10, which in YouTube terms means like your 10th most popular video out of the previous 10. So my least popular video in recent times. And people were like, don't make this into a music channel. We just want Minecraft. <laughs> and that happened for a while. And then eventually, I don't know what it was, the algorithm pushed it and people loved it. People fell on it. So I was like, well, fuck, I'll write a new one. So I wrote Internet Ruined Me and that was a bit of a flop. <laughs> but then I wrote Your New Boyfriend and, and, and here I am now. People respect me a bit more as a comedy musician now, which is good. But before that time, I did, I went into sad acoustic music. I did sad acoustic music for a long time. I had, I have an album out called um, Your City Gave Me Asthma. Uh, your city gave me asthma being originally called cocaine makes you boring but changed upon realizing there was actually no lyrics in the track listing anymore that included the phrase cocaine makes you boring and i'm a bit of a weirdo i like to have stuff pertaining to the lyrics as my as my titles that's just the writing i love writing man lyrics the most important part of music in my opinion probably behind the actual sound <laughs> i mean i like you know sea shanties are popular they're just lyrics but yeah my sad songs uh my little sad album I still get people like Quackity DM me the other day. He DM me a picture of him listening to Jubilee Line and he titled it Banger Alert. <laughs> to which I replied, King shit, King shit. <laughs> and um, yeah, Quackity's very supportive. He likes my music. And uh, yeah, so I, I started. So when I, my writing process for that was actually quite simple. I, um, I basically just sat down and found a tune I liked. Uh, normally very basic picking pattern, three note picking patterns was what I was really into at that period. And I found a three note picking pattern I liked in, in the CG DGBD tuning. And I just sat there and just and just basically played it and just said what I was thinking over the top. And then what I went, what I would do is I'd then record it and any bits I didn't have lyrics for, I'd go over the top. And um, if I remember correctly, Jubilee Line, uh, the first song on the album, the the track was very clearly wasting your time it had that bit first and that was all completely normal and then i just sort of went your city gave me asthma and i was like oh okay this is cool this is cool i was vibing with it but the ending i just went da -da -da -da. i just did that and i was like i'll figure it out later and um it was at that point that I witnessed a very horrible thing on the London Underground. And um, I was like, yeah, this is this is London's fault. And so I tied, so I, I put the lyrics to do with to do with that. And honestly, I didn't think anyone would listen to my album. I wrote it back before I had much internet presence, you know, internet celebrity. I don't want to say internet fame online. So I just kind of did it. And I didn't think anyone would really care because, you know, why would you? It's just my silly whining music. And no one did for a while. Uh, and then someone noticed I'd uploaded to Spotify and then they got it trending on Twitter, which was one of the most humbling things was everyone trending me on Twitter. I'm still always humbled. Even though I'm not on Twitter anymore, everyone tells me I'm trending and I'm always very humbled. Um, I always joke that I'm not. If you ever hear me joking, being like, oh, stop talking about me. I'm, I'm just kidding, man. I'm always humbled by it. I just, I just have a weird sense of humor. Um... Yeah, so people trended it and it became, it's quite popular. It, it, in itself, it pays for my rent. So that album and I don't, I don't, I'm, all I did was upload it. <laughs> so that's pretty good. Thank you for, if you listen to, if you listen to enjoy it. But I've always said that the writing in it is very not my style nowadays. It's very, uh, wet. It's not very, it's, it's not very, it's too on the nose. Which is why, and I stand by this to this day, it's not my album anymore, it's your album. If you enjoy that album, it's all yours. Nothing to do with me. It belongs to you. D&D, &D, I suppose, is the last bastion of my writing nowadays. I've written many, many D&D &D worlds. I have uh, one of my first ones, nothing to do with J. Schlatt. One of my first worlds was called Einschlatt which I took from the German word Einschlitt, which means to, to cut something, like with scissors, I believe, like an incision. And uh, I, I called it that, and it was a, a recently revolutionized druid island where the, where the druids had been keeping slaves, and the slaves had risen up and taken over the island. And uh, that became very popular, and I played that with my D&D society for a while, and they ended up just killing the society every time, so we moved on. Uh, then with my next group of friends, I made, I made Gate, which was this huge, huge island, uh, in this, a desert island, very hot, very humid. 
uh, with a giant gate in the middle of the water. And it was almost like, think of it like the Panama Canal kind of thing. It was the only way you could get through the, con the continental like plates. So everyone had to use this gate. Hence why the town was called Gate and was very rich and wealthy. Uh, I wrote huge stories for that, loads of creative writing there. Uh, my most recent one I'm writing, which is kind of strange, it's a bit unorthodox, is it's all indoors and it's a giant cube. Think of the Howloon Walled City uh, with layers and on le it's 12 stories tall above ground and even more below ground. But level 12 is this aristocratic, like normal D&D town. Then you go down a tier and you've got level 11. Which is the servants and the cleaners and the and the cooks and the p people who help out the aristocrats, you know, but who aren't quite on their level. And then below that, you get the dredges of society, the the thieves, the crooks, the people. Basically, when you when you, there's no prison in the world, when you commit crimes, you're banished to level ten and below. And as you go down, things become more and more strange. There's less and less cohesion. More and more things don't quite make sense, and there's more ridiculousness. One of the levels, I think, it's level five, is uh, the pro the mayor is a chicken, and everyone worships this chicken like like heavily, and they all and they and they give it two set. And when they need a decision, they give it two sets of feed, and there's a plot to kill the chicken. And it just it just as you get lower and lower, it gets more and more ridiculous. Uh, and du and through all the levels, there's an entity called the computer which is an incredibly slow-moving, lumbering, like, abomination that targets a random person in the cube, in this wall, and it, and it goes for them, and it, and it charges at them, but very, very slowly. And the, the, it's called the computer, and all it does is it lumbers around the levels. It can walk through walls, and it can travel up and down the layers without the need of the, of the lift systems that are implemented throughout the cube. And it hunts people down who it deems aren't contributing enough to the to the walls. Think of it like a giant battery, and the computer's job is to make sure that anyone that isn't making enough energy is being dealt with. Yeah, my creative writing's gone very grim dark <laughs> recently, but it's fine. You know, I'm sure it'll go somewhere else later on. But th this is where it is at the moment, and my party, are, I hope, will enjoy it. I haven't got to run the first session yet, but I've written a lot of it, and I've transferred a lot of NPCs across. So there's already like a nice fleshed out world. If you're into writing, and again, I know I've recommended D&D &D already, but definitely do D&D &D if you're into writing. If you're into anything, do D&D. D&D &D. is a great exploration of the mind. Sorry, I'm getting quite sleepy. I'm, I'm, uh, this has been good, though. This has been a long chat we've had. Where's the future of my creative writing, though? I don't know. That's the thing. I don't. I never wanted to be a writer, and I still don't want to be a writer. I don't. I, I, I don't want to be considered the author of anything. You know, I don't have that want. I don't have that that in, like deep need. I know a lot of people, especially in my Minecraft community of streamers, want to be writers. I know I've been spoken to a lot of people who've told me they want to be writers. I can think of three or four off the top of my head. It's a very common career path that people want to follow, especially creatives, uh, who are some of the most interesting people to hang out with in this community. I believe. Yeah, I'm not one of them. I don't. I don't want to be an author. I don't think I ever want to be an author. Maybe one day, it would be fun. Uh, I just. I just like talking. I've got a lot to say, <laughs> so maybe. Maybe being an author is the best step for me. But what's my future? I don't know. If you'd asked me five years ago what I'm going to be doing in the field of creative writing, I would have told you nothing. Because five years ago, I wanted to do music video filming, and I wanted to hang out and be miserable. So that was. That was. That was all that was on my plate. And yet here I am. I'm sure a lot, I, I hope that a lot of you are, are interested in, in what kind of things I'll write in the future. And I'm sure and I, I really hope I can inspire you and give you something to look up to. Because, you know, I've had a lot of people to look up to in my, in my upbringing. And whilst I don't think I'm a good role model, I hope I can be a good writing role model. And that's what I hope to do. And remember, if you're into writing and you haven't had that confidence boost and you haven't had that moment of experience to try it out yet, then definitely give it a go. There's nothing that you can lose, really. Except, except your dignity. But who needs dignity, you know? I'll prove it. Look, I'm going to do something really undignified. Ready? Come! See, I shouted come. You can do anything. Go and do something.